Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Anna Anario. I'm part of the team here that puts on the park forums. Um, we're very, very pleased to have uh, Mr. High Tech uh, Ben Parr here. He is um, an author, an entrepreneur. Um, you're going to learn a little bit about captivology tonight. Um, he's also a managing partner of Dominate Fund um, and an editor of, he was an editor at Mashable as well as columnist for CNET. Um, and most recently, actually a few years ago, he was also named 30 Under 30 at, on Forbes. So we're very, very pleased to have him here with us tonight. So give us a round welcome for <laughs> Ben Parr. If you're wondering what the hell I'm doing over there, I'm periscoping because that's like the hot new thing to do. Also, I want to see if this works or not. Hi, everyone. So um, I'm going to dive right in. I am very sad, by the way, to report that uh, we don't have books for sale here, but I'm going to make you all pull out your phones and go to Amazon.com before the end of the night. <laughs> oh, no, there's, there's an internet access. It's just username, password's the same thing. Park forum. Yeah. Very, very secure. So secure, you should trust buying my book on Amazon doing it. And I'm going to, by the end of this, you'll understand why you should. So I'm going to start this off with a quick video so you understand where I'm coming from. Louder? Mine. Hi there. I can. Hi there. My name is Doug. My So I feel like Doug the dog. Anyone know what movie that's from? Good, good, good. I, I, if you haven't watched this movie, then your life is not complete. So uh, I feel like Doug the dog, everywhere walking around seeing squirrel, and like, what's going on with the world? And so um, over the last couple of years, information creation has gone up exponentially. In, two in 1986, we were exposed to approximately 47 newspapers worth of information. In 2006, however, that number went up to 176. And I was told by Microsoft last year that number of the amount of information we're exposed to is seven full DVDs worth of information daily. And so this exponential increase of information has gone up and up. And we have, like, this is my actual tweet deck. And this is what I have to look at kind of like every single day. And this is what's happening to all of us. We're being exposed to more and more information on a daily basis. And yet, we have this habit of multitasking. And actually, multitasking is not good for us if you want to be, uh, if you want to actually be productive. One study found that those who label themselves as heavy multimedia multitaskers are actually the least effective when it comes to completing tasks and switching tasks and getting things done. And so you have this combination of there's more information than ever, and it's continuing to grow, and you have habits and behaviors that are not helping us with managing that information. And so, of course, it's going to be really difficult to, one, stand out from the crowd and being able to just stand out just a little bit to get your idea heard, to get your product, company, charity, whatever your cause is, even just to get the attention of your kids. But it's also defending your attention from all of that information so that you know which things are worth your attention and time. And so that kind of combination is kind of why I wrote this book, Captivology, which uh, came out last month from HarperCollins. It's about the science and the psychology of attention and why we pay attention to certain people and products, but most of all, how to utilize that science to capture the attention of others. And so in this presentation, I'm going to talk about two key concepts from the book, which are the three stages of attention and what I call the seven captivation triggers. And so I went through over a 1,000 psychological studies, interviewed dozens of PhDs and researchers on the subject of attention, memory, society, sociology, economics, as well as what I called the masters of attention. People like Sheryl Sandberg, Steven Soderbergh, the director, Adrian Grenier from Entourage, the people behind the Old Spice campaign, the Mythbusters, David Copperfield, all these people from different industries to truly understand how attention works at a fundamental scientific level and then how that can be applied in daily life. And so, I'm going to start off with describing how attention works and go into this part. So I like to describe attention as a bonfire. It is something that's built up in stages, specifically three stages. You have to build up to the bonfire, because you can't just start off with it. You have to get the spark and that ignition. Then you have to go and put the kindling on. And then you could put on the big logs. 
and really, really burn the fire. And how I describe that is immediate attention, which is this immediate reaction we have as the first stage, short attention, which is short-term focus, and long attention, which is long-term interest. So let me demonstrate a little bit about the first stage of attention, immediate attention. So immediate attention is this automatic reactionary system that helps protect us from danger <laughs> and helps us react automatically when we are perceived with threats or crazy things like people with giant uh, confetti cannons. Sorry for the mess, by the way. Did I get your attention? Good. It's an immediate response, automatic. It is designed to protect us from danger. It is when you hear a sound of a gunshot, you duck. If you see a car coming at you, you jump out of the way. Because if you didn't automatically react to that, we'd be a dead human species. But then you switch over to the second stage of attention, short attention. And that's when we start purposely focusing on something like a test or a dress, <laughs> this goddamn dress. But it's that, it's that when we switch from automatic subconscious to conscious attention. It is when we choose to listen to a movie, a song, a speak, or something like that. And then the final stage. Oh, before that, actually, let me tell you about the system that controls it, working memory. And so one thing to know about attention is that attention memory is intrinsically linked. And so when you're trying to think about attention, things that don't stick in memory, you did not pay attention to. And so it really is about which things stick in the memory, both short-term and long-term. Working memory is the short-term system that actually controls the memory system, that controls the attention system of short attention. And it's a really kind of complex system, so I'm not going to go into detail on that. If you want the details, I have those in the book. But suffice it to say, it helps us choose and make the decisions of which things we store in short-term memory and which things get put into long-term memory, which leads us to the third stage of attention, long attention. And so I like to describe long attention as the difference between sitting in the car and listening to a Beyonce song and joining the Bayhive and going to all of her concerts, or the difference between you know, getting your first iPhone and standing in line for the $10,000 gold Apple Watch. Is anyone getting that? No one would actually admit that if they were. But it is that difference. It's not one that actually is talked about as much in the psychological research, but I find is fundamentally important. It is because it's not just enough to if with a, get people to watch a commercial. You need to convert them into customers, into users, into fans, into long-term uh, long interest. And it's, I like to kind of say, like, uh, the ignition is immediate attention, and short attention is that kindling, and long attention are those logs and bonfires. And long attention is the kind that goes over centuries and decades and millennia. And so these three stages of attention, your job is to walk them through that. Now, how do you capture their attention and get them to pay attention across all three stages? Well, I found seven psychological triggers throughout my research for two years to that consistently came up as themes, as these different kind of psychological triggers across cultures, across industries, that capture attention for different scientific reasons. And so I'm going to describe them to you in brief. And by the way, at the end of this, there, I'm, I'm going to open it up for questions. So start thinking about questions you want now. I like having good questions, or just fun questions. Trigger one, automaticity. Pop quiz time. You are a hitchhiker on the side of the road. You want to have the best chance of being picked up. What color shirt should you wear? Someone yell it out. Oh, who said none? <laughs> all right, all right. So it always starts out in a color progression of the rainbow until somebody gets to naked. And I know something about those people. I'll, I'll see you at Burning Man. <laughs> so the research shows that uh, there was a, literally a, a French researcher who studied this. If you're a man, most bright colors will work because that those yellows, those oranges, bright neon colors stand out well on the dark backgrounds of you know, gray roads and brown dirt and green grass. But if you're a woman, and they had a study that literally went through this, they found that on average, you know, they'd be picked up about 13% of the time regardless of color. Darker colors like black would perform worse, except if they wore the color red which would actually be 23% or 21% of the time. And the reason actually is because of the subconscious romantic associations we have with red. So in fact, another fun study found that if you put a thick red border around a person's face, 
the opposite gender will rate that person as more attractive than if you didn't have it at all. <laughs> Which is why I, I just love having an excuse to put that picture up every time. But the, what, I'm, what automaticity is all about is these immediate, is this um, automatic response and how we automatically react to certain sights, certain sounds, and certain colors. And it really comes down to two key elements, contrast and association. So as you, kind of, you can tell, uh, one of the key elements is the contrast that a stimuli has with its environment, you know? A loud gunshot in a quiet room, or the color red in a sea of black, or I guess in this case the color red in a sea of roads. But it's also about the associations we have with these colors, these symbols, these sights, these sounds. So for example, you see on Amazon, they always have yellow and orange, right? And these are great colors for buy buttons. Why? Because their contrast is extremely high with, with white and gray backgrounds, your typical background colors for websites. And these perform best when you kind of do, do the testing. But in fact, almost any bright color will do well. Now, however, all right, word association game. Word associations, name things you think when you see this person. Say, yell a little bit louder. I heard carrots, door. Why, why would someone have door? Dorin? <laughs> so here's the thing. Orange and yellow have the lowest correlation with competence uh, for the US. Imagine if, this, if someone came in a suit in that color for a job interview. You would laugh your ass off, purposely and rightfully so, because it may, we have that association. That's not the color you should wear. And, but there's all these different kind of interesting associations. Um, and I'm just talking to the US right now, but there's so many different color ones in different countries that I discovered. Uh, black is the highest correlation with luxury. Blue has the highest correlation with competence. But yellow and orange have a higher correlation with excitement. There's these different correlations that really matter, and that really matter when you're trying to put together, whether it's a brand symbol, whether it's a, a, your, the suit you wear. It all kind of depends. But it's not just suits or colors, it's also smells. So this is the camellia flower, and it was used as a uh, perfume by Revlon a couple of years ago. And it was a success in the US, it smells nice. So they're like, let's bring this to South America. It's gonna be great, we're gonna expand. What they forgot to think about was the association. This is the flower they use in funerals in South America. You li they were literally being like, we have a perfume for you, you're gonna smell like death. Who wants to smell like death? It didn't sell well. And so these associations really matter when it comes to attention. And you gotta really think through the associations people have. In fact, one other fun one that I learned, uh, if you just show um, I, a person either the Disney logo or the IBM logo, sorry if anyone works at IBM, um, if you show either of these logos and you ask them to do a task where they have to figure out creative ways to use a brick, the person who, people who just see the Disney logo beforehand will have 30% more creative uses for the brick than people who saw the IBM logo. That's how powerful these associations are. Trigger number two, framing. Now to do this one, I gotta tell you a story. A story about deodorant. So a couple years ago, and by a couple I mean 1911, there was this teenage entrepreneur, Edna Murphy, she created an antiperspirant. Actually, her father did. Her father was a, sur was a surgeon. He created an antiperspirant for his hands. And he's like, you know, he didn't want his hands to sweat. But his daughter was like, you know what? I could put that in my armpits. So she created this antiperspirant, which I think I still have right in here. I hope I do at least. I'll find it for you later. It's called Odorono. But there was a problem. The sales wouldn't go up very much. And here's the couple reasons why. Back then, these are literally the things people used for body odor. Cotton pads and dress shields. I mean, I know I have like cotton pads in my armpits right now. I don't know about you. I feel like I need to like put cotton pads and just like tear them out and see what happens, how people react. Here, have some cotton pads. They have my sweat. It's going to be great. It'll be worth millions of dollars. It's like Leo DiCaprio. But this is literally what they did. But there are two reasons why. Why they didn't use antiperspirants and deodorants, even though they existed. Reason one. They thought it was unhealthy. They thought it would kill you to wear antiperspirants. Antiperspirants will not kill you. But more important, I, I heard someone say, uh, uh, reason number two. More importantly, people don't want to talk about 
this. They, they didn't want to talk about antiperspirants or that. It was not a ladylike thing to do. It was not a Victorian era thing to talk about bodily fluids of any kind. And so uh, with that kind of thing in mind, Edna Murphy set out to find a way to break into this market. And she started getting some progress, but she had a little bit of issues. This is actually the original Odorono. It's, it, that's literally what she called it, right? <laughs> Creative naming, 1910s. Now, first thing, you got to break through these frames of reference. How do you get people to realize it will not kill you to immediately put on deodorant, no matter what you all think? Well, a doctor invented it. So they advertised that fact hard, and they had these ads that advertised it was created and recommended by leading physicians. That doubled sales. But they still were on the ceiling of how do you get people to use it when you can't even talk about it. So they put out this ad, 1919. Within the curve of a woman's arm, a frank discussion of a subject too often avoided. And they put this ad out in the most popular magazine of the time. All right, who thinks, who can guess the most popular magazine of 1919? No. No. Nope. Answer is, no one said it right, Ladies Home Journal. And so they put this in Ladies Home Journal. And this is basically, as the, the subtitle says, we're going to have a frank discussion about body odor. You do have body odor. I have body odor. But you know what? We could fix that with odor oh no. Oh, that was controversial. Hundreds of women literally canceled their ladies' home journal subscriptions in protest. Hundreds. That was controversial for 1919. But the point was made. What happened was the sales went through the roof. And suddenly, a few years later, Edna Murphy was able to sell her company. And the reason was because she understood the frame of reference of her audience and reframing the message for her audience. And so framing is this kind of effect where uh, we pay attention to certain things and not others based on our worldview, based on our psychological, based on our cultural and biological history. So if I say something like gun control, half of you are going to think one thing and half of you are going to ignore the shit out of me. Or if you, especially if you like said, you know, gun control at the NR, at an NRA convention, you might not live. But that's the sort of thing that really affects the way in which we pay attention. And it makes sense in some way, right? Because if someone comes up to us and tells us that the lizard people are about to take us down, you need to not pay attention to them. They're not worth your time. But these frame of references provide us shortcuts and guides for our attention all the time. And so when you're trying to get attention, there are kind of two ways to do it. One of those ways is to reframe the conversation, like Odorono did. And they reframed the conversation, uh, making it OK to actually discuss body odor. Um, and they adapted to their audience's frame of reference as well, which is the other way, by talking about, uh, because they were concerned about the medical, so they had doctors talk about it. Now, there's a couple other interesting ways to frame of references work in daily life, and I can't go into them all, but I will tell you one. Uh, raise your hand if you like Twinkies. You are all sick and disgusting people. <laughs> Twinkies are disgusting and terrible and taste like cardboard wrapped in toilet paper. Now, this cardboard wrapped in toilet paper a few years ago was, was, about, was about to go bankrupt. Remember that? They went bankrupt. And guess what happened suddenly? Everyone bought Twinkies, despite the fact they didn't taste any better. They still tasted like shit. But everyone bought them because of scarcity. And scarcity is a very powerful tool on frame of reference. And what happens in the research shows is that we provide, we, we pay extra attention and we provide extra value on things that we, do, we believe are scarce. And specifically, things that are scarce because of outside forces. If something is scarce because it's popular, the value we, uh, we add to it is not that much higher. But if it's scarce because of a production error or some other reason, or of a slower rollout, then we will provide, we will give that thing extra value. And you think about this in web design and things like Gmail did it perfectly. I remember some people offering me $100 for my Gmail invites. And I'd basically be like, are you, I, here you go. And I'd get my $100 in PayPal. Because scarcity is a really powerful tool on our frame of reference. Trigger number three, disruption. We pay attention to the people and the things that violate our expectations. So let me give you an example. There was this research study done a few years ago. And they would have, they want to see how memory worked. And they would have students uh, go through a set of different kind of like statements. Statements like, 
The nuns put the food on the table. But then there'd be other statements like, the maid licked the ammonia off the floor. Which one do you think they remembered more? There's actually a scientific term for this, the bizarreness effect. We have a stronger memory for things that are bizarre and out of place. And the whole point of it, actually, is because it's a defense mechanism. Now, let's say, for example, you and I are on a date. So if we're like sitting down on a date, and suddenly a giant clown comes and sits down at our table, we're going like, to be freaked out. We're going to pay attention to that person, right? But the reason why is because it's a defense mechanism. We have to determine whether that clown is a threat or a positive thing. Maybe it's our friend who's about to go to the, uh, go and do a performance at the hospital. Or maybe it's a guy who's about to mug us. Or a gal, you know, equal opportunity. So it could be mug us, but we don't know. And this comes from our hunter-gatherer days. So think about how we kind of thought in the past. We would always be looking for things that were out of place in the past because it was going to either be one of two things. It was either going to be food or a threat. It was either going to be you know, some rodent that we wanted to eat or a saber-toothed tiger about to kill us. And those same instincts in our attention system remain, but we don't have saber-toothed tigers roaming the streets. And so different things capture attention that are out of place. Here's a good example in advertising. Patagonia put out this campaign a few years ago. Patagonia is a clothing company. They put an ad. It was, don't buy this jacket. How the heck does that make any sense? They're a clothing company. You're supposed to buy their stuff. But when they go, you go deeper into it, they explain that what they're trying to do is protect the environment. And they don't want you to unnecessarily buy clothes you don't need. So they'll help you repair your, your clothes and your jackets if necessary. And of course, they'll let you buy one if you want. But they want to make sure that you get the most out of your clothing. By, now, by telling their audience not to buy their clothes, their sales doubled within nine months. <laughs> they bought more of their clothes because they paid attention to the disruption and it was a positive experience. Well, Spice Guy is the same kind of thing. Every five seconds, something surprising and yet delightful is happening. Diamonds are coming out of hands. I wish I could do that. That'd be great. I wouldn't be here right now. I'd be like on a diamond surfboard. But that, that kind of thing. And so the power of disruption is that it has to match your brand's values. And the disruption really captures our attention. But not all disruptions are equal. And I'm going to give you a video example. We love you, Tops! Tops are a dollar off! Waiting for you to have good moments! Hope things to eat or you'll change it! Hope only runs up for a box! Any coupon box! Beware of paper cuts! The Quiznos Tops! Quiznos! Mm, 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 mm. Toast. I, I want you to sit and think about this for a moment. That was a real television ad campaign by a real food company. And they had freak mutant rodents advertising their sandwiches. Would you want freak mutant ninja rodents near your sandwiches or food for any reason? Did it capture attention? Sure. Did it help them with their sales? No. They went bankrupt last year. There is a thing, there is a difference between positive and negative attention, as my bad singing, not, I hope not friends, just demonstrated. Trigger number four reward. So there was this fascinating study a few years ago, and I interviewed the leading researcher on this, Dr. Kent Barrage. And everyone probably has heard of dopamine, right? It's this kind of thing they associate with pleasure in the brain. OK, stop. It doesn't create pleasure in the brain. Let me explain. That's a, mis that's a misunderstanding. So what he did was he actually took the dopamine out of mice, all the dopamine, and he wanted to see what would happen. And what he found was that the mice could still feel pleasure even without their dopamine. You give it sugar water, it still found it tasty. What he found, however, was that with all the dopamine gone, they lost all motivation. And what happened to these mice is that all these mice died because they were so demotivated, they'd rather starve to death than try to eat and survive. And so what dopamine actually does is create motivation. It, it creates wanting. It creates the desire to achieve rewards. And so opioids are what actually create liking in the brain. You've heard of opioids because there's drugs based off of that. But 
we don't act, but when it comes to attention, your job's not to give, is create pleasure. Your job is to create the motivation to achieve pleasure. And though there are two key types of rewards that I discussed. There are extrinsic and intrinsic rewards. Extrinsic rewards you're very familiar with. They're things like food, money, sex, the things you're thinking about all day at work in front of your computer. But uh, those are incredible at actually capturing short-term attention. In fact, if you associate an object with money, and people's eyes will automatically gravitate towards it, even after that object is no longer associated with money. And so it's an automatic reaction, but it's only great for capturing short attention. For long attention, you need the power of intrinsic rewards. Is the power of things like motivation, self-satisfaction, mastery, and purpose. Is having a reason to be there because money is not going to keep a person happy and motivated and paying attention at their job. They need intrinsic reasons to continue, intrinsic rewards to achieve. And it's that combination that captures attention. You must create motivation. Here's an example of how to do that. There was a company, Scopely. They, they were recruiting engineers. And you know, it's hard to recruit engineers right now. So you know, most firms, they offer like, you know, here, $10,000, $11,000 for joining our firm. That's a standard thing, right? But they're like, you know, we're going to do something different. So they parodied the most interesting man of the world campaign. They took the $11,000, put it out in cash, and wrapped it in bacon. And then not only did they give the, um, the engineers who signed up that, but they also gave them uh, a 15-year 15, a 15 Macallan, uh, an oil painting of themselves, and my favorite, a harpoon gun. <laughs> I want a harpoon gun now. After I really want one, but I don't get one because I feel like I will kill someone accidentally using one. But that alone got them over a thousand uh, applications for the job because of surprising rewards. And so what research shows that when a reward is a surprise, it captures our attention, both as an odd and interesting reward, a disruptive reward, or a reward that we are surprised by. And so the re there's another study that what they would do, they would spray either water or citrus into people's mouths. And what they found was the people who could, they, when they randomized the, uh, the order in which they would get uh, either water or citrus, they found that subjects would feel much more pleasure, pay more attention, and have a stronger memory than if they had a pattern they could, they could remember. And so it's about surprising people with those rewards. If you can think about most rewards are done in the form of incentives, right? Incentives are actually the least effective type of reward. There are better types. For example, this is my friend's company, Keep, and what they specialize in is post-action rewards. So say you go on a run or you forget a high score in a game, this will just pop up without you knowing. It'll be like, you've earned a reward. And it might be something like a Gatorade or it might be like a shoe or it might be uh, coins in the game. But the key is that it surprises you. And so what happens with these post-action rewards is that uh, be, the behavior typically is people will stay on the app longer, will pay more attention, and will always say that they were more delighted than weren't. And so what you need to do is go away from, post, from uh, incentives and go towards post-action rewards and other types of rewards that will surprise people. Delight your audience when they sign up. Don't, just, like, don't tell them like if they sign up, they'll get something. Just give it to them after they sign up, and they will feel much more positivity towards you. Trigger number five. Reputation. To do this, I'm going to talk, but I'm going to go and give a change. One moment. Uh, so there is this, this is a scan from a research study a few years ago. And what happened in this study was they tracked the, uh, the brains of college students as they're making economic decisions. All right, And in these economic decisions, they wanted to see how the brains work. And as typical as you would imagine, when you're making economic decisions with money, their decision-making centers of the brain would light up. Now, however, in half the case studies, they would have an expert come in, a, usually, a, um, usually a, an economist in this case. And he would come in and he would give a very conservative piece of advice for how to use their money. And what they found was that the decision-making centers of their brain just basically didn't exist anymore. They didn't light up anymore when they were listening to the expert. It was as if they offloaded the power of their brain to the expert. And this is a phenomenon known as directed deference. And we do it all the time. When a doctor tells us to do something, when we listen to an expert, we pay attention to them because it is a shortcut for attention. We don't know all the medical terms, but the doctor's supposed to, so we should listen to them. And in a lot of cases, it makes sense. 
So, and, but there's even stronger effects of this. So one fun example I found is that there was a study where they would take, they would take subjects and they would put doctor's coats on students. And when they put the doctor's coats on students, they found that these students automatically, just by wearing the coat, had sharper memory, better accuracy, and would perform better on tests. Now, fun best part, best part. They did this for, they did the exact same coat for another set of students, but they told them it was a painter's coat. And their attention and their memory went in the opposite direction. <laughs> Purely the association of expertise creates significant amounts of attention. And there's another reason yet that I'm going to tell you. Uh, so there are three types of authority. There are three types of reputable sources. And the reputation trigger is that we pay attention to these, uh, these things. We pay attention to experts, authority figures, and the crowd. The crowd acts like an expert, and authority figures have power over us. But experts are the strongest of them all because not only do we have directed deference toward them, but we trust them. This is the Edelman Trust Survey. Every year they survey to find out uh, how people, uh, you know, which people they trust most as spokespeople. And who's at the top? Academics and experts. And who's at the bottom? CEOs. We trust experts innately. And we listen to experts innately. And so the strongest and the greatest brands leverage experts. Odorono did this by utilizing the fact that it was invented by a surgeon and advertising the fact it was recommended by doctors. But there's more than just that. Um, it's also the crowd. And as I discussed very briefly, the crowd also acts as an expert. And there's actually research studies that show that when specifically for decisions for um, taste, we trust the crowd almost anybody. Because Yelp and that, we trust their decision making. I don't know if anyone remembers this. I should view, put this video in sometime. Amy's Baking Company. Yeah, some of you watch Gordon Ramsay. That's all I can say. You have to watch this episode. <laughs> Trigger number six. Two left. And then questions. So think about your questions now. Mystery. Who knows what movie this is from? Anybody? Oh, this is a fun. Come on now. No. Thank you. You get a cookie. Does someone have a cookie we can give them? <laughs> I don't have the cookies, I'm sorry. It's Cloverfield. And Cloverfield um, did very well at the box office, partly because it, the movie itself was a mystery of this monster. But it was also a success because of the advertising campaign, because you never saw the monster in the advertising campaign at all. In fact, in their first trailer, they didn't even have the name of the movie. All it had was kids at a party, loud roar, and then the Statue of Liberty's head in the street. And J.J. Abrams, who's the director of this movie, is a master at mysteries. And he utilizes them to capture attention, both in his marketing for movies like Cloverfield and for shows like his shows Lost. And it's because mysteries have a very powerful effect on our attention. Um, there's two reasons. First reason, because of something called the Zignaric effect, because we have a stronger memory for incomplete tasks and thoughts. So she was, this woman, Bluma Zignaric, she was a Soviet researcher in the 1950s. She's sitting in a restaurant, and she's like, I wonder why all these waiters have perfect memory of my order when they pick up my order, and they can completely forget it as soon as they drop it off. And so what she does is she gets a bunch of students, and she has them do puzzles. But in half the cases, she takes their puzzles away halfway through. Kind of cruel, right? But what happens is that she asks these students days, weeks, months later about these puzzles. And guess what? The only ones they could ever remember were the ones they couldn't finish. It's called the Zignaric effect after her name, because we have such a strong memory for these incomplete tasks and incomplete thoughts. But there's another reason that we pay attention to mysteries. Oh, I love this picture. All right, so who wants to go on a date with me right now? All right, so pretend we're on a date. Actually, we're, we're going to be on a date. Okay. We, I, I feel like you know, I might get beat up. So pretend we're on a date. What are we, if we're on a first date, what are we going to do? We're going to kind of ask like, uh, those kind of simple like, questions, trying to figure out those uh, small talk, figuring out you know, who are you, where are you from, what do you like, what do you not like. Why do we do that? The reason why is because of something called uncertainty reduction theory. Because we dislike uncertainty amongst almost all things. 
And when you're meeting a stranger, it is filled with nothing but uncertainty. And so our goal is to reduce the amount of uncertainty within our interactions with strangers. And so when we're on a first date, that's what we do. We're trying to figure it out. Or when we're like online dating, we're trying to figure out information about each of our, these people that we're meeting. But the same is true of mysteries. When we have a mystery that's unsolved or is at a cliffhanger, we have to come back because that uncertainty bothers us. And we have to find a way to complete that uncertainty. It's a reason, for example, why the Malaysian Airlines disaster was so powerful in our attention. And you remember probably, you probably remember where this plane went down, but you know what, planes go down. But that's not the reason it got attention. The reason it got attention is because this plane disappeared and there was a mystery, what happened to the plane? And we do not like that at all. So what we do is we fill that gap with speculation so that we feel better and that we uh, feel like we could solve this mystery in some way. And so CNN did a great job of filling this thing with speculation. But it's the kind of thing that makes us continually pay attention to a story. So a couple pieces of advice. One is to create suspense. And so suspense is a very powerful tool of, uh, of mystery and of attention. And to demonstrate, I'm going to play an ad. When I wake up, well, I know I'm going to be young. I'm going to be the man who wakes up next to you. And when I go out, yeah, I know I'm going to be young. I'm going to be the man who goes along with you. I just like having a reason to put puppies in my presentations. Yeah. But so there was actually this ad, there was this um, there was this study, and what they did was they studied how people reacted to different ads, and what they found actually was that people had a sharp had would remember and have more positive associations with mem with ads that had suspense in them, moment to moment suspense. So in the case of this ad, which was one of the most popular ones of the Super Bowl, you knew you know that. Uh, you know that Budweiser's not going to kill the puppy. The puppy's going to live. They're not nationwide. They're not killing kids. <laughs> you all got the nationwide reference. Thank you. But there's that moment, moment suspense of how is the puppy going to escape? How is the puppy going to get back home? How is it going to escape from the wolves? And it made it for one of the most popular ads of the Super Bowl. And the science supports that. Now, there's another thing that you, could, you should obviously do, which is utilize cliffhangers, whether it's in advertising, or storytelling, or just something where people will want to come back for the next meeting. But there is an exception to where you shouldn't use cliffhangers. You shouldn't use cliffhangers if you're in the middle of a press crisis. <laughs> we all remember this guy. He hasn't had a good year this year. But here's what happened. He had his crisis, and he did the absolute wrong thing, which is he put out a half ass statement that didn't really provide any closure. When you're in a press crisis, your number one job is to end the mystery and create complete closure. In his case, half-assed statement, more stuff came out, he was screwed. You know, even when you think about like Bill O'Reilly, and not that anyone, you know, it's Bill O'Reilly, regardless of what you think about him, made very clear, like, here's what it is, here's what it's not, and made it, and the story ended because there was no mystery, because it's like, here's exactly what happened and didn't happen. Here's a tech example, Airbnb. A couple years ago, there was a gal named EJ, and she was, uh, she rented her place out in Airbnb, she came back one time and her place was completely ransacked, destroyed, burned, really, really badly damaged. She complained and Airbnb was slow to help her. Now, uh, she got fed up enough where she wrote a blog post about it and that went viral. And what happened was, at some point, Airbnb had to respond. And so the CEO, Brian Chesky, responded with this on Hacker News, which I'll just read the first part because you can't read from here. Hey everyone, we were shocked when we heard about this unsettling event. We have been working closely with the authorities, blah, 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 falling asleep. There was no apology, there was no closure. It didn't say, here's what happened, here's how we're sorry, here's how we're gonna fix it. 
Instead, what happened when they put that out, EJ put out another blog post, and the thing went even worse for Airbnb. And so eventually they got the right idea, and then eventually Brian put out this post uh, on the Airbnb blog, which was like, we let her down, and we are very sorry. Here's where we effed up. We were not prepared. And then here's how we're going to make it right, and here's how we're going to prevent this in the future. The story died the moment he published that post. And ever since then, they have been excellent at not letting that kind of thing happen. When there's a crisis, they react so quickly, and they close the loop so fast. When you have a press crisis, you close the loop, because the mystery gap is so powerful in our attention. If you still have an open mystery, people will keep speculating until you are buried. All right, everyone, last trigger and then question time. Acknowledgement, the most powerful of all the captivation triggers in my book. There was this one study. It's sort of, okay, okay, it's cruel. What they did was they strapped electrodes to the ankles of married women. I can tell which, who the married women are in here. <laughs> and what they wanted to see is how much pain they could feel um, based on three different conditions. Condition one, married woman alone in a room. Condition two, married woman could hold the hand of a stranger. Condition three, married woman could hold the hand of her husband. And what they found was the women who felt the most pain were the married women who were alone in the room. They had nowhere to redirect their attention, so they felt the pain. Now, the women who got to hold their husband's hands felt the least pain because they could direct their attention towards somebody that uh, they had acknowledgement and love with. But what I found especially fascinating about that study was there was a direct correlation between the strength of the marriage and the amount of pain they felt. <laughs> The more they loved each other, the less pain they felt. So if you want to test how strong you love each other, actually, don't do that. <laughs> I feel like that's, like that's like a Saw movie. But it shows the kind of power that acknowledgment and that love and that relationship and that community has. And so the science shows that we pay attention to the people and the things that pay attention to us and provide us with validation, empathy, acknowledgment, and understanding. And so I kind of learned this lesson when I interviewed, Do and this is a screenshot from the actual interview, Dr. Thomas Dayson Gutita, the author of Mediated, and Adrian Grenier, who is best known as Vinny Chase from Entourage. They're an odd couple, but together they did a documentary, a really good one, called Teenage Paparazzi, where they followed a 15, 14-year-old teenage paparazzi, and they followed him going around doing the paparazzi thing. And it was an expose on celebrity culture and why we care so much about celebrities. And we had this discussion for about an hour in New York. And we came to the conclusion that why we care about celebrities really kind of comes down to the fact that celebrities reflect a piece of ourselves. They are an identity. They provide a, they show a piece of us. It says something about you, whether you're a fan of, let's say, Taylor Swift, or Sheryl Sandberg, or Kim Kardashian, or whichever one. And it, provide, it shows what community you belong to, and it shows what you care about. Now, there's this interesting effect for us and celebrities. There's this phenomenon known as the parasocial relationship. And I describe it like this. My old boss at Mashable, she works for a celebrity now. Um, she works for Rachel Ray. And what she found was um, that um, Rachel Ray came out in favor of Obamacare at a certain point. And what happened was that her fan base started posting on social media with things like, I thought I knew you. You betrayed me. How does that make any sense? They've never met this woman. They don't know her. And yet, they felt they knew her more than probably their own kids. And the same thing, just, like Justin Bieber fans, they know Justin Bieber better than their own parents. But it's possible because of the parasocial relationship. It's our power to have a two-way relationship or feel like we have a two-way relationship with a one-way figure. And we are really good at this. Taylor Swift does an excellent job of, of building this out. And what your job is, if you have a brand or you're trying to build that relationship, is scale that relationship up using parasocial techniques. Taylor Swift last year, and she does this a great job, she stalks a few of her fans. And what she does is she, like, she sends gifts. And so she YouTubed uh, her wrapping gifts for about maybe a dozen of her fans. And they sent it out and showed videos sending it out. And this went viral. And you know why? Because she's showing she acknowledges and cares about and validates her audience. She cares about them. And she didn't have to give a gift to every single one to prove it. By the mere act of it and showing the act, she was able to show that she really, really cared and she really wanted to help. And so there's really a strong power behind that. 
um, and this power of validating your audience. A BuzzFeed, for example, does this really well. I interviewed Jonah Preddy, the CEO of BuzzFeed, and he told me about an article about the power of EQ over IQ with their articles. So one of the articles they have in the site is something like 37 things Minnesotans are too humble to brag about. And as you could imagine, this article lit up like a beacon on the sharing social graphs of Minnesotans and then across the country. Why? Because it's a positive affirmation of their identity. It says something positive about where they come from and who they are. And it's part of the BuzzFeed strategy and why they do so well. Because you don't find that negativity in BuzzFeed. It's talking about things like things only 90s kids can understand. Things only immigrants can understand. Things only people who uh, are from Chicago would know about. And this kind of thing shows a positive affirmation of identity. And in fact, our social media is a big part of uh, this validation and this acknowledgement effect. We get it constantly through likes, tweets, retweets. We prep a lot of the things we do on social media to get the maximum amount of likes and comments on whatever we say, because it provides us with instant validation. And that validation and that acknowledgement is a fundamental human need. So validate your audience. That is the key. Now, there's a couple of ways to do this. And I'm going to tell you about another way. Now, in the 1950s, Betty Crocker, along with Pillsbury and uh, Duncan Hines and all the bigwigs, were trying to get cake mix to be a thing. And it wasn't a thing. It, people weren't buying it. Ladies were not buying it. And they were like, why isn't this not working? Bisquick is taking off. Why can't we get people to, why can't we get people to buy our cake mix? So they got two uh, researchers to come in and help them figure this out. And the researchers figure out the answer. And the answer was eggs. Some of you may know this story. And so what they found was that um, back then, the, you didn't, they, you, they had powdered eggs in the recipe. So you could just pour, put in some milk, and the recipe would be ready. Um, and in fact, actually, if you try it, uh, there's not really that much difference between powdered eggs and regular eggs. But what they found was that women didn't feel like they had any participation in the product, that they didn't have any uh, they didn't, ha their, their special sauce was not there. And so what Betty Crocker literally did was make their product harder to use by making it so you had to go buy and put in fresh eggs. And then they won the cake wars. Their sales went through the roof and they have dominated cake mix ever since because they provided the power of participation and that validation of their audience. Enable participation. It's the same reason, for example, why Kickstarter is so powerful. Oh, this is the greatest Kickstarter ever. Um, but think about it. Kickstarter is basically a, is an e-commerce website. You buy stuff. But the difference is, is you feel like you're doing more. You are not just buying stuff. You are supporting a cause. You are helping a budding entrepreneur. You get feedback. You get something extra in return. And that kind of powerful thing has made Kickstarter one of the most popular sites on the web. Vitamin Water has even done this, and has done a good job of it. And I, I love this example. So a couple years ago, when Facebook was nascent, they did this uh, campaign where they asked their audience to help them create the next flavor of vitamin water, and to name it, and to go through the ingredients. And people would put on tons of submissions and ask their friends, and this thing went viral. And eventually, they got to a flavor called Connect, which was based off Facebook. And it, but it worked really, really well. And again, it worked because they enabled participation for their audience. They validated them by saying, we, know, we care about what you think, and we believe you're smart enough to tell us what you want next. And it worked remarkably well. So I have given you this kind of quick rundown of the seven captivation triggers from my book. But there's so much more, and I highly suggest taking out your phones now, your laptops now, typing in Captivology on your whatever device, and making sure you buy it. And I will come find you and sign it if you tweet at me or something. I live in the area. I'll sign your books. But here are the seven triggers as a reminder. Automaticity, framing, disruption, reward, reputation, mystery, and acknowledgment. And you kind of notice that these triggers go across all three stages of attention in the sense that automaticity is a great trigger for immediate attention, while disruption is great for short attention, while mystery and acknowledgment are much stronger for long attention. And you've got to really pick the right tool for each one of these depending. So the final thing I'm going to say uh, before closing this out for questions, is that when I interviewed all these amazing people for my book, I found a common theme between all the masters of attention. And it is that uh, the masters of attention don't try to capture attention for themselves. They try to capture attention for their projects, their passions, and their ideas. It is much stronger 
And it is a positive thing to go out and go forth and get attention for your startup, for your charity, for, for your kids, for your career, whatever it might be. That is a positive thing. And, but the masters of Intentia do it not because they want to be famous, but because they know that something that they care about needs to be out there in the world. And so I want you to be uh, willing and thinking about how you can capture attention for what you care about. And so you can get the book on Captivology.com. I have plugged this enough. I know you will all make me happy by doing this. If you want to find me, I'm at Ben Parr on every social network that has ever existed or ever will exist. And thank you very much. next 10 minutes or so. so. 10 minutes of questions, please. I want you all to ask me questions. It'll be amazing. Ask me anything. I have a question. Um, you have a question? All right, start thinking about your questions, people. Um, by the way, I want everyone, when they ask their questions, introduce yourself and what you do. Your name and what you do. Oh, I'm Kelly, and I work for Parks Blue and Situations. <laughs> because Blue has the highest correlation with competence. And because red is overused when it comes to book covers, we went through this entire process. But I, the book is not a romantic book. I don't want them to pay attention because of romance. I mean, sure, maybe I'd get a few more dates if I put a red border <laughs> around. Damn it, I should have thought of that before. All right. Oh, no, no, question. I need to know your name and what you do, please. Hi, Mark the Dad. Yeah, and I want to capture the attention of the U.S. population like they did for AIDS to solve a serious disease that just as many people called myalgic encephalomyelitis, also called chronic fatigue. A huge report that came out from the Institute of Medicine this year saying there's a similar number of people affected, no research, NIH is not funding it, 85% of the people never recover, grossly affected for life, and uh, uh, four out of five are not diagnosed. How do we get that word out to get funding and get the NIH off its butt and Congress off its butt to get the NIH to fund this? This, this, is, <laughs> this is fascinating and this is a much longer discussion because the thing about it is there is no silver bullet. And that's what, the thing I talk about in the book, right? You gotta walk the audience into the three stages of attention. We're at a stage where the vast majority of people are not even introduced to this disease. Don't even know what it is, right? That's the stage we're at right now. So you've got to find a way to introduce them to that short attention, using things like the disruption trigger and the framing trigger to really get their attention. Have you like, heard of Unbroken, a movie that just came out where Hildebrand, the author of that, and Seabiscuit has it, can't get out of a room for two years, has been on the news with that. So it's getting out. And the research was not there, so no one had any it's, it, it may be getting out, but it's not mainstream yet. Would you agree with that? Yeah, so how so, you so the, that's where the, like, I, the example, the best example when I think in diseases and disruption trigger is last year's ALS bucket challenge. It's something that was really, really, really disruptive and unique, and you could not completely predict it, but it was a really unique campaign, and part of the reason why it worked was because it was disruptive and because of the acknowledgement trigger, because you had to challenge your friends, and people wanted to make sure they challenged their friends, and it was acknowledging, you're hoping like, oh, I hope my friends will pick me for this, and that sort of thing helped it go viral. And so really what it comes down to, when I'm thinking about any cause, I really go down to what is the goal, and then how do I utilize these, each of these triggers, or which trigger is going to be best? And then you start to get through how do you really uh, go out there. And in this case, it's about, it's about a combination of reframing uh, the audience so that they know this is a really big deal, or framing it in such a way where they're going to really care more. And then the disruption trigger to find a way to just put it in their brains that they have to, they know what this is. Once you have that, then you use the later triggers to capture attention. There's no silver bullet to it, but I'm happy to talk about that more later. All right, who, who, awesome. Alan Karp, uh, former astronomer. Um, I'm wondering if in your particular case, um, a better name wouldn't help. That's an awfully yeah, so difficult. came up with a new name called SEID that a lot of people like and some hate it. So um, they've renamed it, but the world called it myalgic encephalomyelitis, which drives US people nuts. So the NIH in its great wisdom, when 100 people got sick at Incline Village in uh, the 1980s, they called it chronic fatigue, they called it yuppie disease because a bunch of <laughs> nerds from the Bay Area went up there when skiing got sick, and they said, you guys, it's all in your head because there was no diagnosis. They uh, see 25 yuppies aren't, yupp yuppies aren't cute, those puppies. A, a better name does actually work. Any part of that question, but that's yeah. okay. <laughs> you didn't, oh yeah, we gotta make sure people, 
So I, I'll explain exactly kind of a little bit what happened there. It was just a discussion of how a name can have an impact. And actually, this was a fascinating story where everyone, you've heard of the actor Cal Penn. He's, was in a whole, he's in a whole bunch of movies. Uh, Harold and Kumar going to White Castle, a whole bunch of others. He's the guy in house. And his real name is Cal Penn Suresh Modi. And he was applying for jobs for years trying to get uh, in the door for any of these, like, like, to get any kind of screenings. And they wouldn't get a job. And so for his friends, he just joked. He's like, oh, he was, the friends were like, oh, you should just change your name to a stage name, and you'll get more jobs. He's like, oh, that's silly. So he changed it to Cal Penn. And then he got 50% more callbacks right after he did that. And it's a sad thing, but that's a frame of reference effect, where people have these existing frame of references, for better or for worse, that change the way in which we pay attention. In the case of that, we are not going to listen to a 27-word name. The same thing with the heartbleed bug. There's a whole long string of numbers and letters for the heartbeat bug that the heart, uh, yeah, the heartbleed bug that people talked about. <laughs> ah, say that five times fast. <laughs> but they, when they read Codenomicon, named it and put a symbol on it and went viral because there was a very simple word and a very simple symbol to associate it with. Those things really do matter. A name and a symbol. All right. Um, who this right right here? What's your name? I'm Karen Duncan. I'm working on a uh, grassroots national movement uh, aimed at healthcare quality, improving healthcare quality for all the bleeding hearts in the audience, like myself. What what's the color for my materials for this campaign that c indicates caring, and it's in your own interest to join me. Caring and interest. Um, they are. <sighs> that's a good one. I don't know if I know off the top of my head exactly caring. In the book, I have a whole kind of color wheel system that shows the different ones. Off the top of my head, I actually think the color, uh, the colors are the color is purple and blue. But I'm not off going to say it for sure what it is off the top of my head. But I do. There is a whole color wheel system that um, I do cite in the book that shows like here's the different ones for different cultures and the different associations. So that's a good question. Who's that? Oh, awesome! You have one. Mark, uh, vice president of engineering electronic hardware. So Ben, you briefly mentioned conscious and subconscious. Are there triggers or reasons you would want to focus on subconscious? All the time. It's just the subconscious stuff is just stuff that um, you wouldn't think about but have an impact on what we do. Another example of one is uh, coffee. So if you give somebody a warm cup, a hot cup of coffee, that person will, on average, rate you as more warm and have more positive feelings about you than if you gave them a cold cup of coffee. And it's because we associate subconsciously the feeling of interpersonal warmth with the physical sensation of warmth. And there's all these different little ones, and some of this is priming, these little associations that do have an impact on the way in which we pay attention. You're not going to know them all, but you'll learn a whole bunch of them in the book. And there's a couple other books, too, that go into this even deeper. But there's just a ton. Because these color associations, these symbol associations, do have a dramatic impact in the way in which we pay attention. Like I said before, Disney logo versus IBM logo has different associations and different significance to different people. Hi, I'm Allison Hale. I'm not working at the moment, but I've worked a lot of interesting places. Here we are at Xerox Park. I worked at Xerox headquarters in Connecticut in the 70s. So my question is, when you set up the um, Periscope up there, I thought you said you were going to tell us more about it, and I didn't hear Oh, so Periscope is Twitter's new app. It's live streaming. Let's see if actually it's still streaming right now. It's not. It died. My phone may have died. Oh, yeah, my phone died. Woohoo! Because my, my phone can't hold a charge anymore. Oh, sorry, Periscope people. You know what? That's still funny. So have, was it going before? Were you able to like watch it? 20 people? Oh, you were like, looking on that one. It's interesting. So Periscope is a, is a live streaming app. It's in the same vein as um, there's a couple of live streaming apps that are really making the rounds right now, like Periscope and Meerkat. And it's just I'm, live video is just a fascinating kind of phenomenon. In this case, I was live streaming it to my Twitter followers and some other people. All right, what else we got? Um, Eric Lemons, Eco Green Group. And my question is about global climate change. It's a slowly evolving thing that we tend to ignore. Mm -hmm. We pay attention to things that are immediate and exciting, mm -hmm. but it'll impact all of us and all of our children and the planet in the long term. How do you get people's attention to, to react to that and take action to do something about it? Disruption trigger, framing trigger. I've had to sadly answer this question multiple times. 
The problem always is that to get people to shift their attention, disruption trigger is the strongest one. The problem is disruption trigger in the sense of global climate change is going to have to be something like a iceberg breaks off and a city floods or something really dramatic that gets people to be out of their complacency and be like, well, we should probably save our children. <laughs> Something like that. Honestly, it's going, to take a, it's going to take something super significant. But the part of that problem um, is, all, is framing in the end. It's a framing trigger problem. Is that we have, our frame of reference is dedicated towards closer and short term events. And there's a whole section of the country uh, that is, has the frame of reference that this problem doesn't even exist. And so you have to find a way to uh, increase the ag is agenda setting, is increase the frequency in which this subject appears in the news, in media, in discussion, to a point where people believe and listen more. In fact, there's a, there's a thing called the illusion of truth effect, where uh, the more often people hear a statement, the more likely they're, to th they're gonna think it's true, and they had a study that showed this. And despite the fact, if me repeating the phrase like, lizard people cause cancer, is not true, if I repeat that over and over again, you will slowly rate that as more and more true over time if I keep repeating it. I mean, it could be, you know. <laughs> but there, it's a very powerful effect. So really, agenda setting is really about that repetition and really putting it in there to prioritize something higher. You're not going to change people's frame of reference if they're all, very easily if they're a dead set that global climate change is a thing that is being made up by uh, uh, the left or the whatever it might be. But you just got to. It's going to have to be a combination of. Increasing it as an agenda setting, increasing it in the news, increasing it, uh, the tension around it overall, and probably it's something dramatic, a disruption trigger event that makes people really think, okay, uh, we better like actually deal with this finally. Hi, my name is Nikolai. I'm a Hi, software Nikolai. engineer, and I wanted to ask a basic question. How did you decide to write the book? Uh, I originally decided to write the book because I got a lot of inquiries from startups after I started. Uh, after I started investing. And so for me, it was a lot of, like, when I, when I started investing, startups would ask me things like, you know, how do I get more press? How do I build a go-to-market strategy? How do I build customer and user acquisition? Virality, celebrities, all these kind of areas are attention, right? And so when I kind of looked into the research for the first time, and I've had book deals over the years, you know, and I've had offers, but this was the first time I looked into a subject and I was really fascinated. And what I really believe is that attention is the fundamental lifeblood of the modern economy. You can't get anything done without attention. Teachers need the attention of students. Parents need the attention of kids. You, know, you need the attention of your boss. Uh, brands need the attention of customers. It is fundamental, but uh, most people don't understand how it works or how to harness it or how to capture it. And so that's kind of the impetus for why I decided to write the book in the first place. Because it's an amazing and fascinating subject, but just no one ever wrote something mainstream where uh, putting that research, this amazing research together so that everybody could uh, learn from it and everybody could benefit from it, whether they were entrepreneurs or teachers or musicians or whatever they might be. A few more questions? All right, um, wait. Over here, back. Uh, hi, my name is Daniel. Hi, and Daniel. My, my question, actually, I don't have a question. I actually want to make a comment about attention. Your talk was very good, but I think underlying it, I think there's a shortage of attention that people have these days, in especially sticking their faces in front of devices all the time. Well, isn't that a fundamental problem, overseeing everything that you, you talked about? It's not a shortage of attention. It's, a diff it's a existing attention behaviors adapting to the modern world. And let me describe. Um, the way in which we pay attention has not changed, in my personal opinion. And there are researchers who will debate me on this. We, when we still scan, when we were hunter-gatherers, we would scan for like five or 10 different things because we'd be scanning for food, we'd be scanning for threats. I see someone over there eating food over there rather than paying attention. I just like to be calling people out for shits and giggles. Um, but we have the exact same behaviors now. The only difference is that there are no saber-toothed tigers to eat us. And so we're, instead of, we're still looking for novel information. That's the power of short attention. And the replacement is actually smartphone notifications, is new information in the form of texts, tweets, emails, notifications from our other apps. And they've just kind of replaced the, the, in the system. 
And as a result, that's why we turn our heads toward them, because it's built fundamental to our nature. Does it make it so that we're more distracted? Yes. Is, is it a problem? Yes, because it hurts us when we're trying to multitask across from it. I believe that we're at this kind of crossroads when it comes to attention and how we manage it. Because we've never been in an era where we've had so much information. And we're just learning, just starting to learn how to manage it. And it's going to be a, some time until we really figure out how to uh, better focus and better figure out the ways to manage it. But human species over time has always been able to do this. Honestly, like uh, we've always complained about new technologies like ruining our kids all the time. Like There was an article from 1905 that um, complained about how high glossy magazine articles were going to ruin our kids and their reading ability. We survive, we adapt, we thrive because we have that capability. And so as long as we don't like, you know, flood our entire planet, we'll be OK. All right, maybe one more question. All right, one more question or so? Last one. Last one. Last one. <coughs> I'm Manju, um, ex uh, previous life a software engineer. My question is um, uh, this captivating uh, is a very fascinating subject that you mentioned. But then isn't it about what's the opposite of that? Like you are, if you are the captivating, then you're capturing other people's mind. But you don't want to be captivated. You want to think for yourself. So how do you go opposite to what you just suggested? Well, so um, what I what I believe, and I talked about in the beginning of the presentation, defending attention, that this knowledge, the knowledge of what captures your attention, will help you better defend your attention as well. Be it because now when I see and hear things, I automatically know why is that thing getting my attention or why is that thing captivating other people? And that kind of knowledge alone has made me much stronger and much better at defending my own attention and understanding my own behaviors and habits. And so I focus on this one side of the equation because it hasn't been focused on. There are other good books like Daniel uh, Goleman's Focus that are great on the focus side. But this knowledge alone, I believe, has is is been very helpful, at least for me, in learning how to defend my intention and know how to focus in, how not to be manipulated by other people. And that's one of the big reasons I wrote the book as well. And I hope that it'll be helpful to you if you decide to get it. Great. All right, thank, thank you. you. Ben Carr. <laughs> Thanks for coming to the Park Forum. We have a reception outside. The next Park Forum is on um, April 29th with George Dyson. Um, so please feel free to register and come at the end of the month. Thank you.